says noon, so uh, why don't we go ahead and get started. You ready, Larry? I'm ready. Very good. Um, folks, uh, we'd like to welcome you to our webinar today. Uh, you are muted as participants listening to this presentation. Uh, there is a chat feature that you can access using the dashboard on the right-hand side of your screen. If you would like to submit a question for Mr. Watson or me to answer uh, after the mediation, you may do so at any time. We do review each of the questions uh, and we uh, respond in time. Uh, wanted to uh, acknowledge the co-sponsorship of this uh, webinar with the University of Florida Levin College of Law Institute for Dispute Resolution. And uh, wanted to also uh, mention that uh, along the way today, uh, you're going to have the opportunity to actively participate in a way you may not have done before, and Larry will tell you a little bit more about that. This uh, program today is called Developing and Enforcing Good Faith Standards for Civil Trial Mediations. And at the conclusion of the program, I will provide for you and if you have a computer screen in front of you, you will see in front of you the uh, CLE number for CLE credit to the Florida Bar. Let's go ahead and meet today's presenter, uh, Larry Watson. Larry is known to many of you. He is uh, literally the guy that wrote the book on mediation. Larry is the principal and founder of Upchurch Watson White Max, along with the other folks on the on the letterhead, and I am your moderator today. My name is Brandon Peters. I am a dispute resolution counsel at Upchurch Watson White and Max. And what I'd like to do uh, is uh, tell you that you can see the the screen in full if you click that red arrow up towards the uh, right side at, near the top. It's the minimize your dashboard arrow, and that'll help you to see. Um, each slide in its in its full uh, glory. I want to begin um, with uh, a quote that uh, comes from a 2002 article in the Journal of uh, Dispute Resolution. It reads as follows: If I act for the big bad wolf against Little Red Riding Hood, and I don't want this dispute resolved. I want to tie it up as long as I possibly can, and mandatory mediation is custom made. I can waste more time, I can string it along, I can make sure this thing never gets resolved because I know the language. I know how to make it look like I'm heading in that direction. I make it look like I can make all the right noises in the world, like this is the most wonderful thing to be involved in when I have absolutely no intention of ever resolving this. I have the intention of making this the most expensive, longest process, but is it going to feel good? It's going to feel so nice we're going to be here and we're going to talk the talk, but we're not going to walk the walk. Yeah, and that's the exact kind of attitude about mediation that uh, we need to put a uh, kibosh on here. And today we're going to look at the prospect of uh, defining and enacting good faith standards for civil trial mediations to sort of head off that sort of uh, attitude. A couple of overall points about our program. First, uh, Brandon and I are both civil trial mediators, so th this program is, this material is being presented from the perspective of uh, mediations with some direct or direct indirect involvement with a civil litigation proceeding. Um, not to say what we're talking about wouldn't apply to family law or to um, uh, county court or uh, contractual mediations. Um, it's just who we are and where we're from and uh, sort of our perspective. And secondly, uh, there is a fairly significant body of academic material out there uh, related to the subject. Uh, this presentation isn't meant to be uh, a result of an exhaustive search of those authorities. If you're interested in reading up on uh, the, the, the enforcing and, and, and uh, good faith standards in mediation, there's a, a good article in the American Journal of Mediation by Rachel Hutchins. It's entitled Defining Good Faith Participation in Mediation and it can be found on the um, uh, American uh, College of Civil Trial Mediators website at 
www.acctm.org. It's www.acctm.org, and it's a um, it's a good a good starting point to get on it. All right, there's our program, the overview. Uh, we're going to start off with a little look at the uh, the current standards that are out there now, sort of a status report on what body of law is out there dealing with good faith, bad faith in mediations. We'll look at the enforcement policy question uh, that, that's been raised. We'll look at the problems, some of the issues with defining standards of good faith and bad faith in, in a mediation. Uh, we'll talk about the satellite litigation problem that's often cited um, as, as an issue for this, the confidentiality problem. Uh, we'll look at um, uh, confronting the cause uh, or the environment that creates what can be seen as good or bad faith in mediation. Uh, and then we'll come to some sort of a conclusion on it. Along the way, we're going to be conducting a couple of polls to sort of sample the audience here on how they feel about issues that uh, are involved with this subject. So be aware there's going to be a pop quiz or two if we can get the technology to work. So let's start with looking at the uh, current good faith standards, and we find those out there in enabling statutes, uh, court procedural rules, court orders, administrative rules, uh, court opinions, case law, and, and certain ethical standards. So starting with the statutes, um, there are currently 22 states that have enabling statutes setting up mediation um, with a good faith requirement of one sort or another in the statute itself. Uh, it's important to remember, though, that the types of mediations referred to by these statutes will vary by subject matter. There'll be uh, legislation set up to mediate trailer park disputes and homeowner disputes and uh, insurance disputes and so forth, and they they will in, in, in involve some good faith standards and require good faith standards by the participants, but their value in looking at a general civil trial may not be particularly helpful. The typical language used in these uh, statutes that uh, require people to participate in good faith or require them to negotiate in good faith, it's pretty general language. There's only one state we found uh, where the statute seeks to define good faith. And interestingly enough, that's a Minnesota statute requiring mediation to resolve agricultural loan disputes. And it's really a, a definition of bad faith. It, it, it says that you, you'll mediate these sort of loan disputes and you're in bad faith in that process if you fail to attend without good cause, if you fail to provide relevant financial information necessary to mediate the dispute, if you fail to designate a representative with authority to settle, if you fail to provide written statements regarding uh, alternative resolutions for it, and then any other behavior which evidences a, a lack of, of good faith. Um, so the statutes don't offer a lot of help as we're looking around for that. Procedural court rules, I think uh, beginning with the federal courts, uh, it's been argued that Federal Rule 16 establishes a federal court rule requiring good faith in mediation. Federal Rule 16, as you know, is the um, uh, pretrial conference rule, and it has a general statement in there that says uh, any pretrial conference activities we get involved in are going to be conducted in good faith, and arguably mediation might be a pretrial conference um, animal. Um, 21 federal district courts have uh, good faith requirements in their local procedural rules, and interestingly, uh, the United States District Court for the Middle District of Florida, our local bankruptcy court rules, until June of 2014, uh, had some extensive good faith requirements in their local rules, including one that said, the mediator shall report willful failure to participate in good faith to the bankruptcy judge. Uh, that got changed in June of 2014 after a lot of debate by the uh, Bankruptcy Rules Committee. And the new rule now simply says parties are encouraged to participate uh, in the mediation in a good faith attempt to resolve the issues between them. Um, 17 states have good faith requirements in their procedural rules. Many uh, specifically authorize sanctions for bad faith. Some list specific acts of bad faith. 
but there are no common definitions given, there's no um, unity in the approach, and many of those state rules, not Florida, but many of the state rules mandating good faith, bad, bad faith and mediation, require the mediator to report to the court, which is kind of interesting. Uh, another area where we find um, existing law, if you will, uh, dealing with uh, good faith, bad faith, and mediation is in the independent uh, court orders. These are the court, the specific judges who have uh, mediation referral orders, and, and in their language, there's a lot of um, talk about good faith and bad faith. For example, in the federal district court in Florida, uh, in the middle district, there, there's a uniform case management order you're mostly familiar with. It's used by about three-fourths of our uh, federal judges, and it has language that says all parties must appear at the ordered mediation and, quote, participate in good faith. Uh, other middle district orders uh, that are out there, parties must appear and, quote, spend as much time as necessary for a good faith effort to settle. Um, the description of the federal mediation process uh, that's on the website for our middle district in Florida um, describes mediation as an event in which both sides must negotiate in good faith. Uh, the local <laughs> Florida circuit court orders can get really weird with this. It's really interesting. I'd love to uh, simulate a collection of all the mediation referral orders in the state of Florida but it's a changing scenario. They, they, the judges tend to change them. I mean, 64 circuits, I think, in Florida. Each circuit, 10, 20 judges, 30 judges, some of them, and they each have their own individual mediation referral orders. There's a lot of language in the one I've seen. Proceed to mediation in good faith. A um, couple of instances where the absence of good faith or attendance without authority will be subject to sanctions. One that I found particularly interesting said, I think this was from South Florida, uh, offers, counteroffers, negotiating positions that are clearly inappropriate and for the purpose of sham compliance with this order to mediate shall be sanctioned as a fraud on the court, not subject to confidentiality under uh, 44102, and the mediator shall immediately report such conduct to the court. Oh, that was kind of a directed court-ordered mediation. Uh, no authority is often cited in these orders as bad faith, not subject to confidentiality, and shall be reported. And then there's one, of course, here I found that says not paying the fair share of mediator's fees is bad faith, not subject to confidentiality, and uh, should be reported by the mediator immediately. Well, we probably need to see uh, more of that type of language in the in the court orders. Yeah, you you got to love that guy. Obviously, a retired mediator. Um, we also find um, some good faith, now we're getting a little further down the pecking order, in the administrative rules that set up mediations for various uh, departments of the government. Um, there's um, a, a, a lot of rules that talk about good faith participation in specific kinds of mediation. Uh, I, and I did a recent word search in state regulations for mediation and got over 2,000 hits to give you an idea of what's out there. We have no idea what they're saying as a group. I did see one that was interesting. The Department of Financial Services in, in defining mediation for windstorm claims uh, has ruled or has put in the regulation that the adjuster, the insurance company, is in bad faith if they don't have adjuster present at the mediation with a complete file in hand, the adjuster at the mediation isn't familiar with the file, uh, the adjuster at the mediation doesn't have a complete copy of the policy in his hand. If the adjuster hasn't viewed the property immediately before the mediation, and more importantly, if the adjuster isn't empowered to write a check at the close of mediation, uh, they're in bad faith according to this Department of Financial Services regulation. Otherwise, in the regs, we see bad faith as continuous disruption, unduly argumentative behavior, belligerent, adversarial, and so forth. And again, in the administrative rule, there's a lot of instances, like some of these court orders, that require the mediator to both determine whether bad faith is happening and to report it if it is. Um, we've had court opinions out there where sanction motions have been filed and specific uh, 
activity reviewed and the courts have offered opinions on whether or not the, the complained about uh, event constitutes good faith, I mean bad faith, um, and those court opinions are all over the place. Um, New York has ruled a lot on these, and New York State Court ruled failure to appear with settlement authority is bad faith, uh, a refusal to speak, to allow the lawyer to speak, or to listen to the explanation of the process was ruled as bad faith. There was a federal district court for the Middle District of Florida that ruled that the apparent use of the mediation as a process to extort money was bad faith. Um, one of the more notable court opinions on bad faith didn't so much have to do with defining what is bad faith, but sanctioning it. Um, there's a case in the Northern District of Florida, uh, Federal District Court on uh, Girls Gone Wild, you may remember that that show where they would film girls at festivals. Well, this apparently um, they filmed some underage uh, young ladies, and the parents sued the producer of the of the show. He was ordered to mediation in Federal District Court in the Northern District of Florida, and he showed up, uh, according to the record, with a tank top and cutoffs and flip-flops and proceeded to throw spit wads at the plaintiff's lawyer as the opening presentation was being made. Uh, he made rude barnyard noises uh, during the uh, discussion of the case, um, threw things around, slammed stuff around. Uh, they filed a motion for sanctions. It came before the judge. The judge warned him to stop that sort of thing and go back and try again. He went back, tried again. Uh, same thing happened again and went back to the judge, and the judge put him in jail. Uh, sanctioned the, the bad faith activity in mediation by cooling his heel and in the pokey. Uh, Larry, I don't know if I uh, seem to always draw the short straw, but that sounds fairly typical of my experience with uh, mediation. <laughs> Throwing spit wads at you, yeah. Well. Um, on the other hand, when you look at the court opinions, um, there's a Texas state court that made a ruling, it's kind of interesting, that basically said the court can order the party to mediate, but a court cannot order parties to mediate in good faith. In other words, you can't do that. Uh, you can't order a good faith, uh, an order requiring good faith negotiation is void. You can't sanction for failure to negotiate in good faith. And the logic used in that opinion, Fort Worth, uh, Texas uh, uh, State Court, um, it's against the principle of consensual mediation to force parties to negotiate a settlement. Um, and then finally, as we look at the body of law out there that would in, have some impact on good faith, bad faith, there are uh, ethical rules out there, and particularly, uh, now this would apply only to the lawyers, not necessarily to the parties, uh, but the model rules of professional conduct have a number of rules that, that would uh, control the lawyer's conduct at the mediation. Um, Rule 1.2D says you can't assist a client in a fraudulent act. Uh, rule 3.3A says you can't, you, you, you're an ethical violation if you fail to disclose a material fact to a tribunal. Yeah. Which of course begs the question, uh, is the mediation process a quote tribunal? Well, there's a mediator a tribunal uh, and that hasn't been decided uh, to the to the extent the mediator to the extent a tribunal is someone who who uh, performs an adjudicatory function, uh, which is real purpose of the rule. The history of the rule was don't miss, don't hide things from the judge. Basically, uh, you would say no, the mediator wouldn't be. But more and more now, we're having the mediators appointed by the courts and and taking on the uh, I don't know if it would be a tribunal or not, but we got that ethical standard. There's a, another ethical standard, 3.4, that just says you can't conceal material facts from a third person. Uh, 4.1 talks about making material misrepresentations of fact, not necessarily concealing facts, but misrepresenting facts to third persons. And on that one, there's a note, there's an exception on it that, that notes that puffing isn't to be regarded as if a lawyer is puffing a claim or puffing a a negotiation that's not necessarily a misrepresentation and certainly a statement of value of claims is an exception to that one. 4.4, um, you can't engage in bad faith use of litigation. 
to the extent mediation is subsumed in the litigation process by virtue of a court order, um, possibly that, that, that could come into play. And finally, 8.4 talks about not engaging in dishonest conduct. There is a tremendous body of work out there. Uh, the American Bar Association um, section of litigation produced, had a task force that I was fortunate enough to work on and that produced a, a document entitled Guidelines for Ethical Settlement Negotiations. And what this document does is tie together the ethical standards for the professional conduct for a lawyer with settlement negotiations and comes up with a, a series of best practices and, and that kind of thing in in ethical. And that ought to be required reading. Uh, there's a rather lengthy um, website address there at abnet.org, litigation ethics, settlement negotiations. Um, but again, these are all limited to lawyers. Uh, and so when you sort of look at the total body of law out there uh, involving good faith, bad faith, there are no uniform standards of conduct for mediation players. There, there are no generally agreed definitions of what's uh, bad faith or good faith in a mediated settlement process. Um, the ABA dispute resolution section filed a report in August of 2004 that said there are more than 100 state and federal statutes and rules requiring parties to participate in court-mandated mediations in good faith, but dealing with good faith and bad faith is kind of overshadowed by defining it. Uh, we have sort of a Justice Potter Stewart, I know it when I see it kind of kind of norm that going on, and the courts are, as we've noted, all over the place in their enforcement procedures, everything from putting people in jail to saying they can't be enforced enforced at all. And and part of the reason part of the reason for that lack of any I submit for the lack of any significant body of law dealing with good faith, bad faith, is the fact that there is a substantial debate going on within the ADR community as to whether or not we should adopt and enforce good faith standards in mediation at all. Um, there are a lot of pros and cons being thrown about uh, that, that have sort of put a damper on, I think, in any significant movement in this area. And, and it kind of works out this way. Uh, when they look at the question, should we create and enforce good faith standards, those who say yes, it's like, well, come on, we, we, we have to preserve the meaning and the trust in the process. We, we need to avoid abuse, wasted time and money that's involved with going through a pro forma mediation that, that, as we indicated in that first quote that began the program, we walk on the walk, and, but we're not talking, or we're talking the talk, but we're not going to walk the walk. Um, and by the way, mediation has become a critically effective judicial docket control tool. Uh, we need to have, it needs to be viable, it needs to, it needs to work. Uh, those who, on the other hand, say no, we shouldn't enforce good faith standards, we shouldn't go down that path, Let's talk about the lack of definition, uh, how do we define these standards, um, we don't want to inhibit freewheeling and consensual negotiations with people looking over my shoulder when I'm harmlessly being a jerk in my negotiations. Um, they talk about the satellite litigation problem uh, and, and, and then the compromise of, of confidentiality. And, and that's the sort of the broad base thing, which kind of leads us to our first poll. Before we get into the weeds on these issues, I kind of like to get, Brandon and I kind of like to get a, a feeling from the audience listening here. What's your take on that? I mean, just without getting bogged down in the details, should we seek to compel good faith at all? Is it, is it worth the effort? Well, let me read the uh, first poll question for the benefit of our listeners. The question is, <clears throat> as a matter of policy, should we seek to create and enforce good faith standards in civil trial mediations? Well, what you need to do is use your mouse to click one of the boxes, either, either yes, enforce or sanction, or click the box no, do not enforce or sanction. And take a few seconds and register your answer, and then we'll display the poll results so that we know what our listener audience thinks about that all-important threshold question.
There we go. Uh, 68 percent, over two-thirds of our listeners believe uh, that it is appropriate for the courts to enforce or sanction uh, um, uh, good faith standards. And uh, again, the question was, as a matter of policy, should we seek to create and enforce good faith standards in civil trial mediation? 68 percent of the listeners said yes, and 32 percent of the listeners said no. Thank you all, and you'll be asked a few more times to register your uh, votes for different polls. Okay, well then that kind of leads us to the next question we've got. Um, if, if, assuming we have an agreement, okay, we need to come up with some good faith bad faith standards, we need to provide for enforcement. What's the target? What is the conduct that is the key thing that we want to, to attack? Let me read this one. Uh, this is our second poll question. What is the most frequently occurring act or omission by mediation participants that you would consider to be bad faith? And you get to select one. The first choice is disruptive behavior. Number two, lack of preparation. Number three, lack of authority. The fourth item, failure to negotiate, i.e. no offer, no demand, no response. And the last choice, dishonesty, such as misrepresentation or an omission. Please register your votes and we'll display the results. Half of the people indicate wow. the failure to negotiate, which is my own personal experience, uh, <laughs> is the biggest is the biggest problem. Fifty percent. Next in line, the lack of authority at twenty eight percent. The next problem, uh, dishonesty, thirteen percent. Uh, disruptive behavior, six percent. And finally, uh, the lack of preparation, three percent. What do you think about that, Larry? That's 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 interesting. That's interesting. Um, the uh, Fair to negotiate. Uh, well, okay, so we're going to majority obviously say we need some. Uh, the fair to negotiate, fair to make an offer is one of the key targets. So let's let's start the process. Let's look at why we don't have those kind of rules out there. The first question we get is, all right, how do we define and format these good faith standards? There are two basic options, or three really. Uh, do we identify and mandate acts of good faith? Uh, sort of a this is what you must do, or do we identify and prohibit acts of bad faith? Uh, this is what you must not do, or maybe is it some sort of a blend? Uh, when you look out at the authorities, what's been done, the, 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 what they've said, and, and define sort of what's the good list, what are the kinds of things that have been suggested, you see things like reasonably comply with laws, rules, orders, governing mediation, reasonably comply with the agreements to mediate if you've uh, contractually obligated itself to mediate, uh, reasonably comply with the mediator's rules, attend with full authority to settle, uh, prepare and exchange pre-mediation submittals, stay until the mediator declares impasse, participate in meaningful discussions, and come on, be truthful. Uh, those are just, in looking around at, at, and, and defining acts of good faith, this is what some of the commentators have suggested might might be on that list. On the on the other side of the argument, what's the bad list? What are the what's the thou shalt not list? Uh, engage in disruptive, aggressive, and unduly behavior. Use the mediation solely to benefit litigation. Neglect uh, obligations to the process in terms of appearance, submittals, participation, and so forth. And here's one that hit home with this audience: refuse to make a reasonable offer or engage in meaningful negotiations, uh, and finally intentionally fail to comply with any item on the, the good faith list. Um, if you sort of dig down into these standards though, and you're going to note that the good list contains words like reasonable and meaningful and substantive, uh, subjective terms that, that have an uncertain definition at the outset. And, and the bad list of things not to do you know, nowhere in that bad list has anybody suggested that you know state of mind has got to be part of the working of, of, of the de of working definition of bad faith. It's bad faith is more than just bad judgment. Uh, it's, it's more than carelessness or neglect, or it's really even more than just being obnoxious. It's it's there's a there's a in, malicious intent element there that 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 needs to be part of the 
the acts constituting bad faith. Uh, but all of these uh, create subjective determinations. And in fact, when we define good faith, bad faith standards, we need to be very careful of objective versus subjective language. Uh, if to effectively enforce these rules, we need to have uh, yes, no, on off kind of rules to the, to the greatest extent possible. Um, we need to minimize the subjective standards, the well it depends and the maybes and the sometimes kind of rules and and try to maximize standards that that have objective criteria with them. And in fact, when the uh, American Bar Association dispute resolution section looked at this problem back in August of 04, um, they specifically came out with a resolution that said sanctions should be imposed only for violations of rules that specify objectively determinable conduct. And they gave um, objectively determinable conduct examples as attend the mediation. Uh, that's okay, the party, the attorney. Uh, remain at the mediation for a specified time. Okay. Uh, provide advance written memoranda at the mediation, and, and yeah, those those are objective. You know, I mean, that's sort of a yes/no, on/off switch kind of a rule. But are these really the sort of bad faith things we normally see torpedoing mediations? Um, if if there's a failure to attend after a court order telling you to attend, uh, I don't need a rule. Um, I got a court order that's been violated, and I'm subject to sanctions anyway. Uh, leaving early, I don't know. If that's a major cause of mediation failure. And how many mediations have you had go down the tubes because someone maliciously and intentionally failed to provide a pre-mediation memo? Uh, I noted that the lack of preparation was very low on the list of folks with having problems in the, the, the poll we did earlier. Uh, on the other side, that same dispute resolution section council in August of 2004, uh, passed a resolution saying sanctions should not be imposed for acts involving subjectively defined conduct. And then look at the kinds of things that they're saying are subjectively defined conduct. Failure to engage in substance of bargaining. Subjective, can't do it. Failure to make a reasonable offer. Failure to have adequate authority present. Um, Got a couple of problems with that approach. Uh, first of all, I will note that failure to make an offer and failure to, to bargain is one of the areas we seem to have a lot of concern with in, in this group. I would point out that the National Labor Relations Act has a requirement in it that says the parties must engage in substantive bargaining in, in negotiating union contracts. And, and there is a substantial amount of case law that talks about what constitutes substantive bargaining and what doesn't. Uh, they talk about shadow bargaining and, and that kind of thing, but it's, it's nothing that we need to run away from. Um, but in any event, if we just lost the word substantive there and just said fair to gauge in bargaining. That's kind of an on-off switch that might work. The same with fair to make a reasonable offer. Um, what about a fair to make any offer? Uh, I don't care if it's reasonable or not. And then finally, with the authority, that, that's a major pet peeve with us. Um, it's hard to accept the notion that the present authority at mediation is a subjective standard. Uh, this is one of the primary areas, areas of mediation abuse. It's one of the primary reasons for failed mediations. It's one of the principal items of frustration and angst among those mediators that are, that are out there trying to do the work. It's hard to believe we can dodge this issue by calling it too subjective to deal with. Um, the logic used by the um, ABA section, ADR section, when they when they came up with this is whether a representative's authority is adequate turns on the actual value of the case. The value of the case is subjective. In reviewing adequate authority, the courts would have to value the case. These are all subjective determinations we don't want to get into. Um, it may be true, but it centers on the word adequate. It assumes the absence of authority at mediation is a simple result of someone inadequately valuing the case. I don't know that inadequately valuing the case is necessarily a bad faith issue. I don't know that that's a malicious, intentional act designed to torpedo 
the mediation. Uh, we can deal with that. The real authority issue goes a lot deeper. What about in Florida, for example, no authority to pay up to the limits of the policy or the plaintiff's last demand, whichever is less, as clearly required by our rules. What about no authority to pay anything? What about no authority to even negotiate? Um, I don't think undervaluing the case is the real source of lack of authority problems. If the case is undervalued and there is a good faith intention there, we, you know, we've evaluated evaluated the case at so much, and but we didn't know this and we didn't know that, and that, that kind of thing flushes out. That they, we can agree to adjourn and continue. There are people that are prepared to change their minds. That they're still looking for a settlement, and if they don't and we end up having a complete difference in, difference in the value of the case, then that's what we got a lawsuit for. Uh, let's find out what the jury says it's worth. If we and, and the Florida Supreme Court Committee on Mediation Rules, and I was a member of that for many years, and we kind of got on this uh, this this notion of, of authority and 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 sought a definition that doesn't have a lot of subjective aspect to it. And what's in our rules now, as most of you are familiar, authority is one the legal capacity to bind a party to an agreement. That's yes or no. Uh, there's no gray area in that one. Uh, and the secondly, that he's a final decision maker on all the case issues, that yes or no, he is or isn't. And that's what our rules require, that's how we define authority in our rules, and, and we did that in, an, I think, a fairly objective fashion. Um, so I'm not real sure that the objective versus subjective problem is insurmountable. I think we can minimize the subjective, we can deal with the subjective. Again, we've got We've been dealing with reasonable standards and wrongful intent for 200 years in our courts, and that's not a that's not a major problem. Put our minds to it. I think we can get past that. So the next problem that the authorities cite is well, we can't can't have good faith standards for mediation because of the satellite litigation problem. Uh, it's all we're going to do is create more lawsuits. Um, we're supposed to be settling them, not creating them. And they used the Rule 11 example. Uh, many of you n remember in 1983, Federal Rule 11 was adopted. It was uh, intended to eliminate frivolous filings, to cut down on litigation. Instead, some authorities have noted that it created pandemic litigation, uh, as attorneys used the rule as a weapon uh, to delay, to run up fees, and basically bust each other's chops. Uh, since then, uh, Rule 11 has been cut back. The judges have cracked down on it a lot, but the effect is still there. Uh, I have personally seen cases where, after a year of litigation, one case I had, there were 32 pending, 32 pending Rule 11 motions that these guys had filed at each other. That's before it got the mediation. Um, and there's a fear the same reaction is going to occur if good faith rules are are instilled with mediation. But let me just say this. I don't think satellite litigation itself is the problem. Some litigation is going to incur, occur with any standard of any rule set. It, it, it's the only means we have of enforcing a rule. When you create a rule, you expect to enforce it. And certainly the fact that you may have to sue someone to enforce a rule is no logical basis to say, let's do away with the rule. The, the real problem isn't satellite litigation uh, to enforce good faith rules in mediation. It's the potential for excessive litigation, for unfounded litigation, for bad faith litigation, and misusing the existence of the rules to launch unwarranted and frivolous claims, misusing the court process itself. And it seems a little oxymoronic for us to say we can't adopt the rule to prohibit bad faith because people might act in bad faith in trying to enforce the rule against bad faith. That's kind of trying to solve the problem by running away from the problem. Excessive, unfounding litigation in any form is not good, but that's a problem with the legal community and, and what, we, what we're doing with each other as, as trial lawyers. Um, the problem with enforcing uh, good faith standards in mediation that perhaps is the real problem, is a significant problem, is the confidentiality. Um, how do we enforce good faith standards 
when it would often require revealing what went on during a confidential mediation process. How do we enforce good faith standards in mediation without violating mediation confidentiality? And that's the, the big one that people raise in opposition to creating rules. Well, Brandon, we're mediators. Let's rephrase that question. That's what we do. How about if we ask, how do we enforce good faith standards in mediation while maintaining the level of confidentiality necessary to sustain and support the mediation process? Um, no question, confidentiality is critical uh, to, the, to the mediation in the eyes of many. In Florida, as you know, we've gone past confidentiality. We've adopted a privilege uh, attached to mediation communication. Um, and, and the fundamental principle there is we need to create a protective environment to allow the parties to make concessions and admissions essential to reaching settlement that won't come back to harm them if settlement isn't reached. Concessions toward reconciliation often contained in mediation communications should not be used uh, to prove liability. They need to be kept totally confident. Now, there are folks out there that say that's about as far as we really need to go with confidentiality. As long as nothing's used in, in court as, a, as an admission, why do I need anything else? Um, and we've already got that with evidential rules. But we don't really need to go that far. Uh, we, can, we can ask again what level of confidentiality is really necessary to sustain support the mediation process. The goals of confidentiality are we don't want any fear of admissions or concessions being used against us in adjudication. We want a free and open discussion of settlement options, and we want trust in the mediator and trust in the process. Uh, and, and we can have all that. Uh, but, you know, we've already recognized that we can achieve those goals acknowledging there are some mediation communications that simply don't warrant confidentiality, either because it isn't necessary to support these goals, uh, to give these kinds of con communications confidentiality, or we've made a moral judgment that certain communications don't deserve the protection of uh, any protection. They, ought to, they should not be allowed to grow and fester under the umbrella of confidentiality. Such, so as, for, the, such, such as the guy at the uh, Girls Gone Wild mediation who is making uh, barnyard noises. That's not yeah. the kind of thing we would protect. Exactly, exactly. And if you look at the Uniform Mediation Act, um, they, they came with a top-down approach to confidentiality on mediation. Everything goes on as, as confidential, and they throw a blanket all the way over everything. And then they start working through, well, wait a minute, commission of a crime shouldn't be protected, so let's poke a hole in the blanket for that. Threat of violence during the mediation, that shouldn't be protected, but we'll poke a hole for that. Professional malpractice, well, no, we can't have that protected, poke another hole. Uh, professional misconduct, yep, ethical violations conducted in the course of mediation shouldn't be protected. Uh, the last time I looked, I thought there were, there were 13 exceptions to confidentiality in the Uniform Mediation Act, and I think there's seven exceptions to the exceptions. All communications for which we've ruled, or the, 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 the lawmakers have ruled, confidentiality is inappropriate. And I'll point out real quickly, note professional misconduct is one. And we've already noted that there are ethical violations, by lawyers anyway, that could be um, uh, an impact, that could be the same thing as bad faith in a mediation process. And to that extent, we've already sort of got a toe in the door on whether or not um, they would be protected or not under confidentiality rules. Um, then the question becomes, all right, why should acts of bad faith in mediation be given the protection of confidentiality? Um, why don't we have a hole in the blanket for that? Uh, does keeping bad faith confidential promote trust in the process? That's one of the goals. I don't think so. Does keeping bad faith confidential promote a free exchange of settlement options? In, in fact, by providing confidentiality and even privilege to protect acts of bad faith during a mediation, aren't we sort of encouraging it? I um, mean, we're providing an, uh, an environment where it can fester and grow. Opening the door to exposing bad faith, uh, however, 
creates another problem. And this digging deeper, what about the mediator? <laughs> Should the mediator uh, be required to confirm or deny bad faith by a mediation party? You know, many times the mediators are one that sees it and uh, in its rawest and ugliest form. Uh, should the mediator be required to report it more actively? Should it, we've got a lot of court rules and uh, out there anyway. Uh, there are people that say, well, why not? Uh, on a purely objective basis, uh, why not? Uh, again, what, what, what goals of confidentiality are being met um, by having a mediator with a gag on reporting or being involved in any kind of uh, exposure of bad faith? Um, mediator trust. We want to we want to make certain that the party committing bad faith has the benefits and comfort of trust in the mediator. I don't know. Uh, in any event, would someone actually committing bad faith openly admit it to a mediator? Anyhow, most of the time I see it, people are denying it right and left, even though they're doing it. Um, if if a mediator's obligation had an obligation to report bad faith or recognized, would that do you, would that serve as a deterrent if, if parties knew, wait a minute, this guy's obligated to report me stepping out of line here, uh, would that slow things down? Uh, a reporting mediator, uh, there's some business issues, and, the, and if you went around and sampled all the mediators in, in the state, I mean, they would uniformly would say, no, 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 we don't want to be involved in that, we don't have anything to do with that. And, you know, we're not making friends here if we're reporting bad faith with someone. It's bad business for us. Um, it's, um, it's it's not a good thing. And these are legitimate concerns, more so to the point, even though I'm engaging someone that's committing bad faith, if I need to have his trust if I'm going to talk him out of it. <laughs> I need to be able to have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with him. But but that kind of brings us to another poll. Uh, I'd be interested in a take take from the uh, the audience here. So we want your opinions now, folks. Uh, you'll see the poll question in just a moment, and I'll read the question. It, it is as follows: Should the mediator be involved in enforcement of good faith standards in mediation? Uh, using your mouse, please select yes or no and we'll display the results in just a few seconds. Yeah, and I would say involved here means reporting, testifying, revealing, verifying, being a rep, think squealer, or a responsible officer of the court, you know, whatever. Just in any way involved in the process. Sixty-seven percent, two-thirds of the people voted yes that we mediators should be involved uh, in the enforcement of good faith standards in mediation, which of course leaves the one third that beg to differ. Wow. Okay. Uh, well, the there are other ways. Uh, that's interesting. That's interesting, and that would require some modification to our confidentiality rule. That would require some modification to media eth mediator ethical standards. But that that's interesting. There are ways to get around it, though. Uh, we can minimize the need for mediator involvement in the way we craft the rules. Again, going back, if we if we have objective standards, these yes/no aspects on defining the good faith rules, the fact of compliance should be open and obvious. Uh, there's the, what we call the party certification procedure that take the communications in question out from the umbrella of confidentiality, uh, and I would point. Uh, Again, with some pride to the Florida Mediation Rules, Rule 1.720E, where we did exactly that on the authority issue. When we readopted the definition of authority, we also included a requirement for, uh, for, the, for the parties themselves to file a certification directly to the court uh, in advance of the mediation, confirming that this is the identity of the representative I'm going to bring, and I'm confirming to the court that that representative is going to have the authority required by the rule. Now, if there's a question of whether or not the authority was present, there's a basis uh, for the court to inquire upon a motion or something uh, to, to bring the party up and say, hey, you told me before you started this mediation that you were going to be there with, with the, you were the final decision maker. Was that true or not? I'm getting some questions about that here. 
I don't know that that's necessarily going to stop the problem. Um, you know, someone who would lie to you may lie to you under oath is equally uh, well, but but it should certainly slow it down. Um, so developing rules that try to minimize the need for mediator involvement would be helpful. Um, another thing that we might think about doing is, is sort of attack the situations that create an environment where bad faith or conduct that might constitute bad faith can arise. Uh, and, and this is uh, this, the source of this is, is the tension between court-ordered mediation and, and then having a, a, sensual pro, a consensual process. And the court's ordering me to mediate, and I don't want to negotiate. <laughs> uh, some cases, you know, very few, very few, but in 30 years of doing this, I've seen some where there is a business decision here. There's a business corporate policy involved that just we can't settle this case. We can't we can't concede to this. We have to have a guy in a black robe tell us this is how it's got to be. You know, that's that's rare. Less rare, I've seen cases, particularly involving governmental entities when we're working under statutes and what statutes mean, can't settle because frankly we need judicial input. We need the judiciary to, to, to do what they were constitutionally set about to do, help interpret our laws and tell us what the legislature meant <laughs> by adopting this law. And then some cases, of course, just simply aren't ready to settle within the time frames that the court sets saying you've got to mediate. Um, and a way to deal with that, uh, our rules provide for a motion to defer. Um, we need to educate the bench and the bar to focus a little bit on pre-mediation motions to defer. If you put these root issues on the table, these these things that are going to block meaningful settlement negotiations, even if they're ordered to to commence, let the judge decide early on. Or, or another good way, uh, approach the mediator early on and say, look, I've got a problem with mediating this. We have a corporate policy, so forth and so on. Many times, the mediator can work to head off the potential bad faith environment. That, that's out there. Um, so, bringing it back around, our conclusion on it, I think creating and enforcing good faith standards will be a challenge, no question about it. Uh, defining the standards, uh, enforcing the standards, I think we probably need to rethink confidentiality. Uh, we need to change the way we practice mediation a little bit, but um, clearly think it can be done, which kind of leads us to the fourth and final poll question. So if the listeners would please uh, take up their mouses again, uh, if this question sounds familiar, it's because it is. The question is, as a matter of policy, should we seek to enforce good faith, which parenthetically means sanction bad faith, <laughs> in mediations? Uh, your options are to select one of the two following answers, yes, enforce and sanction, or no, do not enforce or sanction. Please take a moment to register your response and we will display the results. At this point, after uh, an hour of hearing <laughs> uh, Larry's very reasonable explanation, 79% uh, of the people have voted yes, we need to enforce and sanction, which leaves 21% that said no, uh, do not enforce or sanction. Yes, and I think that that is a little bit of a growth from what the first one showed. We have a few more coming over onto the enforced side. Well, and and um, that that's food for thought. Uh, we probably need to be working on that. The illogical point would be the uh, uh, the Florida Supreme Court um, uh, the Committee on Rules and uh, Mediation Rules and Policy, um, the, the the Florida Bar um, ADR section. Um, a lot of avenues might get started and that kind of thing. Well, Larry, uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, walking us through this uh, most informative uh, talk, uh, developing and enforcing good faith standards for civil trial mediations. Any last thoughts? No, I just um, um, I, I think we're going to take take this in for this is good information and a good a good poll on the community here. I think we're going to take this and and see what we can do with it. 
uh, folks, just in case uh, you can't see it on your screen, the, the Florida Bar course number for today's presentation is as follows. 160907-6N, as in November. CLE credit 1.0 CLE credits for your attendance today. I'd like to thank my friend and colleague Larry Watson for uh, his work uh, that went into this very useful presentation. Uh, I'd like to also thank the University of Florida Levin College of Law Institute for uh, dispute resolution for its ongoing support and co-sponsorship of uh, this webinar in our series. Uh, finally, uh, let me uh, mention that uh, my colleague here at Upchurch Watson uh, White and Max, uh, mediator, arbitrator Lawrence Colon, will be joined by shareholders uh, Bob Cole and Michelle Jernigan to present our next webinar uh, in a, a presentation entitled Other ADR. And that will take place on Thursday, June 18th. Uh, they will discuss uh, whether uh, the court retains the ability uh, to refer the parties to a specific form of ADR. Uh, and they'll discuss some new rules that are now uh, pending before the Florida Supreme Court concerning that subject matter. So we look forward to uh, that presentation uh, next month. And again, thank you so much for your participation today. Just one more time, the Florida Bar course number 160907-6N, as in November.